Hello and welcome to tonight's event. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jan Fran. Uh, I am a journalist and TV presenter. Very much looking forward to going through Antoinette Latouf's debut book, How to Lose Friends and Influence White People. Here is my copy, evidence that it has absolutely been read, which is why it's bent and it looks terrible. Um, before we do jump into that, though, and before I introduce Antoinette, who's um, sitting off to my side, I do just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and to any First Nations people uh, joining us this evening. Welcome. Thank you so much for your company. Um, this is a really good read. It's the gamut of emotions. I found myself nodding along. I found myself getting a little bit angry, I found myself disagreeing in some places, um, and that felt good to me as, some, as, a, as a book reader. Um, for those that don't know Antoinette over here, who I call Tony because I've known her for so long, even though I'm not allowed to do that um, on this occasion, um, she is a multi-award winning journalist and co-founder of Media Diversity Australia, so that is an organisation that works to increase cultural diversity in the media. Um, you've probably seen her <laughs> Wherever they say SBS, ABC, Triple J, Sky, Channel 10. She's been everywhere. Um, this is her first book, How to Lose Friends and Influence White People. Um, it is a very witty and approachable anti-racism guide. It uses a lot of warmth, humour and research to share tips on how to combat racism. Now, Antoinette did write those words, but I, <laughs> I fully agree. Yes. That's why I'm saying them. Um, in 2019, she was named among AFR's 100 Women of Influence. In 2021, she was awarded a Women's Agenda Leadership Award and a BNT Women in Media's Champion of Change. Oh, stop it, Jan. I'm blushing. Oh, who wrote this intro? <laughs> I've got to tell you. Um, although there was one award, very important, peer selected at her Year 10 <laughs> High School Formal, awarded most likely to die a virgin. A proud um, moment. <laughs> I can confirm she's not dead. And she's definitely not a virgin. Um, she is, however, an ambassador for Parents Mental Health Organisation, the Gidget Foundation, and the Australian Thyroid Foundation. So, welcome, Antoinette, and congratulations on this book being out there in the world. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you for reading it and feeling that gamut of emotion and sometimes disagreeing because allyship and anti-racism work, um, it's not linear. People come at it from different um, starting points perspectives and it really is just a conversation starter and some mm. evidence-based tools on what to do whether you're a white person a person of color um, a first nations person what we can do uh, to work towards a fairer and more equitable australia yeah it's a very practical guide and we're, we're going to get to that so yeah. it gets it's a it's a good kind of combination of theory anecdotes but also practical tips um i do want to get this question out of the way because i feel like it sets the tone and i know you've been asked a thousand times, but why? Why Why write this book? Why is it needed? <sighs> yeah, look, I think um, as a journo or you know, as a professional and so many other people in similar situations to me who find themselves talking about racism and diversity and inclusion, we kind of wish we didn't have to. We'd wish we could just be good journos, good lawyers, good media commentators and just be professionals who are good at our jobs. It's not until you get to a certain point in your career in certain power structures media being one, politics being another, ju the judiciary being another, that you go, hold a second, the institution is part of the problem when it comes to racism and inequality. Mm. And I'm working, um, and if I'm, if I'm not part of the solution, how much am I just complicit and part of the problem? And so as my media career progressed um, and I saw so few people around me who have diverse backgrounds succeed you know Jan, Jan mentioned her, you know, we've known each other for a long time and that's the thing when you're a person of color in this industry yeah you know everyone else we literally know everyone else because <laughs> there's five of us um, and so it's um, and I just thought oh I was approached to write a book which is not um, necessarily the usual trajectory and I was asked um, what do you want to write about do you want to write a children's book do you want to write this and then I joking and I said oh, what you know what about some of the stuff you do um, representation um, you're quite vocal on that um, and then I jokingly said something like along the lines of oh like how to be unpopular like what book would I write because anybody in the past who's been vocal about racism um, they've been significant uh, there's been significant backlash um, mm. and so it, it, initially it was a bit of a joke um, and then the publisher at the time was like that I think 
think you're onto something, I think that's the book. Mm. Um, so that is how I came of all the topics in the world and all the genres I came to write about racism in Australia. And the title now clearly makes sense. You know, you're talking about being unpopular. It's called How to Lose Friends yes. and Influence White People. So how to become deeply unpopular <laughs> while talking about, you know, a pretty um, intense subject matter. Yeah, I think I just wanted um, A, to be a little bit provocative and a little bit cheeky because it's obviously a take on Dale Carnegie's very famous, very successful How to Win Friends and Influence mm. People. And, I, um, and so many of the things he talks about, which still ring true today, um, you know, don't condemn, complain or criticise. And then in my book, I'm kind of telling people to do all of that. Um, but how to do it um, and select which audience that you're doing it to and how to have the most impact, but also how to um, how to manage when you come across resistance. Because Australia is so uncomfortable talking about racism. Everyone, mm. like we get mm-hmm. these... Like, I don't see colour. Um, I'm not racist because I have a Chinese neighbour and we wave to each other every morning. Um, and this kind of really superficial grasp um, of racism and a complete denial about the ongoing impacts of colonisation and the fact that our country, whether or not we like it or not, or we've played a role in it, is rooted in racism. The very formation of Australia is rooted in racism. Mm. People just refuse to talk about it, let alone do something about it. Yeah. Um, you, you talk a lot about the sort of pushback or backlash that you get talking about this kind of stuff and even even to your book. Um, one of the funnier things that I was reading in the book was, you know, your research sort of found, I, I, forgive me if I get the numbers wrong, but something like, you know, 0.5% of broadcasters on a particular network were of uh, people of colour or Indigenous people. Indigenous, yeah. Yeah, or Indigenous. And then I think one of the higher-ups kind of pushed back and is like, well, actually, it's not 0.5%. It's, 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 it's higher than that. I think it's about 1%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, there were so many to, <laughs> to and fro about the, where the decimal point should be, but it was really over whether or not it should be. Uh, the researchers hadn't rounded it up. It was so st- statistically insignificant. Right. The researchers hadn't rounded, rounded up to 1%. Um, and I was like, if that is your gripe, if that is your takeaway about the fact that your television network has pretty much 0% Indigenous talent, um, is that your fight? Is that your battleground? And that, that's what can happen in this um, when you're talking about things like this. Rather yeah. than actually look holistically at structural racism, people will start to nitpick yeah. and look for faults and go, oh, you're stuffed up there. We can't believe you. Because I read that and I'm like, I mean, 1% is... Still quite bad. <laughs> exactly. Let, let's just say five percent. You it's, know that's it's still bad. It's still bad. Yeah. Um, where have you gotten? Because prior to this book, obviously you launched MDA, and a lot of um, a lot of that has informed some of the stuff that you write about in the book. Yeah. Where has the most uh, pushback come from, or the weirdest pushback, or pushback that you just did not expect? Yeah, and I think that's a really important part. We talk about how to lose friends because there are some people that you kind of know. You've got your crazy Uncle Darren or whatever on Facebook and you know he's a redneck and you know that you fight. Um, and so there, there's so often people that you go, okay, they're in staunch opposition to progress. They're um, pretty privileged or pretty blinkered or just a bigot, whatever. We know that. So that pushback has been predictable. You and I have been targeted by similar ilks of far-right people. That That is not surprising it's not comfortable but it's not surprising Mm. it's when it comes from people that you think should be more progressive or people who champion other causes be it gender um, disability it's when it's when pushback and criticism and racism comes from those cohorts that you think gosh like you you can get a bit blindsided because you think oh I thought um, you were on board you were on side and so there's actually one chapter and it's called letting go of unexpected families Mm. Um, letting go of friends, family and unexpected foes. And it's the unexpected foes that can really hurt. Um, and over the past few years, and I mention it in the book, um, a person that was my mentor, we no longer talk um, because I think he, he, he... The more vocal I got about um, diversity representation and anti-racism, um, he's a middle-aged white guy, the more uncomfortable it made him feel. Mm. However... You're not going to lose all your friends, and you will make new and improved ones. I do want to <laughs> put that out there. Yeah. Because people might be thinking, why do I want a book that's going to make me lose all my friends? It's like, well, no, it's it's just about being honest that change um, doesn't always come easily. Yeah. How do you deal with it, though, when it's somebody within your own family? Because there are certain friends, you know, the mentor in this particular situation, I mean, yeah. you were able to kind of let go of that relationship in many ways. But in other instances, it's people that you 
really know and love and actually have to live with and see all the time. And they're people that are in your own family that might give you a bit of pushback when you're wanting to talk about issues around racism. How, how do you navigate that? Look, it, it's, that, is, that can be really tricky. Um, and within that, I mean, I don't have all of the answers, but within that I speak to an expert um, who's a psychologist who's actually started a practice specifically for people of colour who are dealing with racial trauma, um, who are dealing with... And sometimes uh, people go, oh, what's that? And often it manifests as um, kind of insomnia. Sometimes it has similar symptoms to PTSD. It's people whose life experiences have culminated and started to get... Of racism started to interfere with their ability to live and be happy. Um, if it's a matter of your physical and mental health, then you need to step away, you need to set boundaries. Um, sometimes it's worth communicating why you've set those boundaries. Um, sometimes you don't even have to because the very act of having that conversation again and again mm. can be extraordinarily tiring. Um, for, a, for a white person who wants to, who's an ally, who wants to uh, challenge things that they see within their circle, um, look, it's, it's not always easy, but I do talk about looking at audiences on a scale of one to five. And one of your kind of your staunch supporters, it's people who are really on board, uh, and they're important because you need your cheer squad, you need to have your support network, and then five for your uh, um, Craig Kellys. Um, five oh, wow, <laughs> that's, yeah, I thought he'd be a 100, but yeah. <laughs> um, and so you go, okay, well, Craig Kelly and the like, and, you know, really racist Uncle Darren, um, don't bother with them, and don't exert that energy, because sure. they're never going to change their and that's okay, because luckily they make a small, they make up a small portion of the population. It's the twos, threes, and fours where most Australians live in that movable middle. They might be a bit sceptical, interested, not that politically involved, bored, yeah. time poor. They are the people I think you should care most about. Um, and in and in in terms of going back to your question, how do you deal mm. with some family who you really love? Um, if it's a five, I would say sadly. Don't bother. Um, yeah, okay. Cut ties, or, or never, just don't bring it don't, up. Never, never, never speak about it. Never feel that that conversation is going to go anywhere because it's just not, and you're not going to change my hearts <clears> and minds. <throat> you're going to, and you're much better, you know, speaking to that people people in the middle where thankfully more Australians are, and you're more likely to convert them over to all one. Mm. Um, there is a chapter in your book that uh, that really sort of resonated with me, particularly called "Being Off White." Um, which you know uh, it resonated with me because you you talk about be, you talk about people of color. I'm not a huge fan of that. I'm not a huge fan of any terminology okay. that yep. describes um, it's, it's so fraught, minorities, complex. ethnics, people of color. That's I don't think we've kind of got to the point where we found the right terminology to do that. Um, but in this particular chapter, you talk about the sort of racism that's perpetrated by and between communities of color. Um, I'm just curious. Because your, your book is so, it's very much rooted in the Australian context. Mm. And this is something that I sort of struggle with myself. Or we're from the same community, I should say, mm. Lebanese, um, Australians. Um, do you see yourself as white? No. What do you see yourself as? Um, I see myself as, oh gosh, culturally, linguistically diverse, a person of colour, separated from, and I think in what I do, a, di a distinction I make in my book, uh, black, First Nations, people of colour as separate. Um, sometimes people, as an umbrella term, it can conflate uh, and simplify what I call a, I call it the uh, hierarchy of hate. But at the end of, at the heart of racism is anti-blackness. And some of the stuff I mm -hmm. talk about in terms of other minority groups, including ours, being anti-black as problematic. But I don't see myself as white or black, but as someone in between. Um, and th there I identify my role as being an ally um, challenging racism within my own community, but also challenging anti-blackness more broadly to, um, among white Australians and among, well, not, not just individuals, but the structural racism, which really at its heart is anti-black. Um, but no, I don't, I don't see myself as white. Yeah, because I think sometimes, the, I, I think I have a certain, um, uh, 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 the privilege of anonymity, call it that, where mm. I'm never going to be the first to be racially abused on a bus because I don't outwardly yeah. present... As You're not wearing a hijab. I'm not wearing, wearing a hijab. Yeah. I'm not, you know, a tall black man, for example. Yeah. I'm not someone who is like North or South Asian. So, you know, if a huge racist is on a bus yelling profanities, they're probably not going to target me first. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain degree of, I guess, whiteness that I am contending with mm -hmm. um, and was wondering if you were kind of contending with 
that yourself in yeah, in and, and, I, and, and, I, and I talk and I talk about that. I talk about you know, even the fact of being um, on commercial television. And when I joined Network Ten, gosh, about twelve years ago, I was uh, conscious of the fact that I was the first Arab um, or first Arab reporter on commercial television. But I also knew that I had my name's Antoinette, which is French. That I might be Middle Eastern, but I don't wear a hijab. Mm. I have straight hair. All of these kind of this. Uh, this proximity to whiteness that worked in my favour, that's fine. And what, what I implore people to do in this book is to sit, find, identify where you are. Mm. Don't feel guilty about it. Whether you're a white bloke called Andrew um, or someone like us who have certain privileges because of the way we look, where we, we don't stand out as much or we don't wear a hijab, that's okay. Identify where you are, but that's not in the anti-racism space. That's not your resting place. It's your starting point. Mm. And then acknowledge your privileges don't diminish the experiences of others. Because what you get among sometimes our community um, or even Europeans, um, uh, Southern Europeans and even um, Eastern Europeans is, oh, well, it can't be that bad because what the Africans are experiencing, what the Indigenous people are talking about, can't be that bad because I'm also not a white. Like diminishing the experiences other people face and not acknowledging that we get away with a certain amount of things if, you have, if, if, if your name doesn't have, t- surname doesn't have 12 letters in it. Mm-hmm. If your, um, your, your job application doesn't get tossed in the no file because it's clearly Muslim or it's clearly Asian. Like, I, I just think um, in that chapter of Off-White, I, I implore people to scrutinise. Don't, don't ignore or diminish the severity of racism just because you have certain luxuries that allow you to be less targeted. Yeah. I mean, there, sometimes it can be difficult to write about the um, racism that exists within minority communities and that's perpetrated also by... You know, minorities. Um, it's there. Yeah, I think we can both tell you that. Yeah, very um, much so. But you, you've obviously found it important to include that in your books. It's not just about influencing white people; it's about influencing you know everyone really. Yes. Um, why? Why did you feel it was so important to have that chapter in there? It was after Black Lives Matter, uh, after George Flo- George Floyd's death, uh, reinvigorated the Black Lives Matter conversation locally. And I, I do say reinvigorated because Indigenous Australians um, have been championing Black Lives Matter for way before George Floyd's death. Yeah. Um, and then when uh, upon witnessing certain culturally diverse communities posting things like All Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter um, and sort of distancing themselves from Black Lives Matter and actually being openly quite racist towards the Indigenous community um, and showing really anti-Black attitudes, both locally and broad, um, internationally. And I was like, oh, my gosh, why and how is this happening? Um, especially among certain communities that have been targeted by both police or by the media, like our, you know, like our own communities, especially mm. post Cronulla riots. I thought, how could you be, how could you have uh, lack such empathy or be so short sighted? When I started to look into some of the research, there was so little research in this area. A few of the scholars um, looking into it said this is a grossly under researched area, but it is so important because it's a survival mechanism. So many. Um, Minority groups think if the tension's not on us, if we kind of err to the side of, um, if we point the finger in that direction and go, it's how terrible we're going to be the good minority, um, and we're going to be given it's a false sense of security. Mm. We're going to be given a bit of a free kick. We're going to be given a bit of a leg up, but that's not how structural ra- that's not how structural racism works. Maybe in the short term, um, the attention is off your your particular group, but it's not how you achieve equality and fairness for all. Just because the focus is on um, indigenous communities, uh, it doesn't mean you're not going to face structural barriers at a workplace level, a health, you know, in the health mm-hmm. system, mm-hmm. education. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I thought, I just had to call it out. If I'm asking white people to self-reflect and do better, well then I need to ask that of myself, and I need to ask that of my own community and other diverse communities mm-hmm. to be a pro, like a proper ally to to, um, to black communities. Uh, what's the feedback been? Um, on your book, have you gotten people getting in touch with you? Have people yeah. um, left some comments in the comments section? Yeah, look, so far, surprisingly, I mean, I don't know if people have been distracted by the election, but so far, it's been overwhelmingly positive. Even by certain more populous news outlets, have been um, really um, positive in their coverage. Um, a lot of people, particularly who are not black and not white, um, like us or somewhere in between, have said, "Thank you. This speaks to." experiences I have and how I wrestle with what my place is and what role in anti-racism um, I should play. Thank you for the tools. Um, so far, and I hope this continues, Indigenous uh, communities or Indigenous individuals haven't felt that I've spoken for them. 
um, mm-hmm. or you know, I, I interview a lot of Indigenous people. I speak a lot about blackness, um, but I was very careful, um, very careful not to um, to amplify and be an ally. And, and for me, that was so far that's been what I'm most proud of because. I think it's if, if we can't get our if I can't get my allyship right and be you know and be open to strengthening community that those relationships um, then I can't be asking that of others. Mm. There's um, like I said this is a very kind of um, it's both theoretical um, but it's a practical guide on how I guess to be anti-racist or how to how to combat yeah. racism um, in Australia. Um, I, <laughs> I don't like reducing it to give us your three hot tips, but there are a lot of tips in here. Yeah. So I am yeah. going to say. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Well, at the end, of, at the end of each chapter. Yeah, there are tips. There are there literally, are literally how to yeah. this and how not to because I think you've got to get beyond the theoretical. And a lot of people would nod in agreement and say, "Yeah, I want to do better. How can I do better?" But I don't want to speak for other people. I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to be cancelled. Um, and so what I've tried to do uh, is use research and humour and personal experience. And each chapter ends with how to. Okay, so the first thing I would say, if you're three tips, really be honest with who, you, like, why you're doing it, because nothing precedes purpose and intention. If it's just to seem popular at a time when people are taking to the streets um, and to be performative, like, well, then you're probably not going to be that effective. So I think you've got to be super honest about what it is you're trying to achieve. Secondly, situate yourself within that. Like, what can you do based on who you are and your personal environment? So it's okay, as I say, if you're a 50-year-old bloke called Andrew, a white guy called Andrew, um, and you own a small business, that's your starting place. Because I, I, Unless you really are comfortable, get away with the guilt and the denying that, oh, but I'm not racist, I don't see colour. Get rid of that because it's just bullshit. Um, be honest about who you are and what you can influence so then you know your arena. Um, and then thirdly, find your niche. So let's go to let's go back to Andrew, for example. 50-year-old Andrew who owns his own, owns his small business. Andrew might think, you know what, I don't know what I can do to stop Indigenous deaths in custody. What can I do? It's like, that's okay. But look at what you can influence with your resources, with your skills and within your context. And that may be uh, working on diversity and inclusion in your workplace, having a strategy, uh, providing anti-racism training uh, and ongoing training to your to your staff. Hiring more diverse people, ensuring that they get into positions of power with the right support. So it's not about one individual. Like you or I, Jen, as magnificent as I think we are, you or I are not going to you or I are not going to single handedly dismantle structural racism. I've chosen certain avenues like um, public discourse and media um, as a way to do it, and everyone situates themselves in that fight, mm. figures out really why they're there and what they want to do, and finds a niche and just focuses. My, my three hot tips. Well, I think there are um, some great tips there, and I think this is a, probably a great place to end our chat. Um, for you guys, though, if you haven't uh, bought a copy of the book, there is a link in the description as to where you can buy the book, How to Lose Friends and Influence White People. Um, this is the first event that Booktopia has sort of had in person since 2020. Mm-hmm. I really hope that soon we'll, they'll, we'll go to the next level and we can have an actual audience. We don't have one in this particular instance, but we would still love to hear from you in the comments section. If you know someone who might benefit from reading this book, give them a tag. If you've loved it, um, leave your comment in the um, in the comment section. If you haven't loved it, keep that one to yourself. <laughs> yeah, and don't bother, <laughs> don't bother tagging racist Uncle Darren. He's not your audience. Yeah, so think he's not about, going to read the book. Think about yeah. the twos. And the threes and the fours. fours. Yeah. Yeah. The ones and the fives, we know where they're at. Yeah. Think about who might be the twos and the threes and the fours. That's, I think that's a very, very helpful tip. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us um, tonight. It's been a real pre- pleasure. Thank yeah. you, Antoinette. <laughs> Not Tony, Antoinette. And congratulations on thank you. your book being out there in the world. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hope you enjoy it. Bye.